Hello everyone, welcome back to lecture four of Code of Civil Procedure with Jyoti Bhere. I hope the last three lectures have been clear and there is no confusion with the last three lectures, especially lecture two, because there are certain audio issues with that particular lecture. Please forgive me for that. Now, I hope last class what we have covered is the institution of suits, parties to a suit, or frame of suit, etc. Those all topics are clear. Today we are moving forward with pleadings, uh, plaint and written statement, that is order 6, 7 and 8. Because they are three lengthy topics, that is why we might not cover, we might actually not cover, we will not actually cover the counter claim and set off. Written statement also we will see how much we can cover today. So, so now let's moving on to today's topic of pleadings. As we have already seen in the previous classes uh, that about the jurisdiction, about how the suits have to be instituted, how joiners have to take place, etc. Now we'll move on to the part of pleadings. Now, first thing, which which place do we find under the code that uh, deals with pleadings? That is order six. Now, firstly, we need to understand in simple terms what do we mean by pleadings. Now, pleadings are statements in writing by each party, where each of the parties is stating the contentions, giving the required details to the other party so that they can prepare their case accordingly and then give an answer. So these are pleadings. Now what are we doing? What are we trying to achieve with such pleadings? With such pleadings, we are trying to ascertain the real dispute that exists between the parties. We are trying to narrow down the area of conflict. We are trying to preclude surprise attacks from happening. That is, everybody should surprise attacks in the sense that here we are trying that everyone, whatever I want to say, I'll come out and say it directly. I'm not trying to hide something and later on I'll come and bring in that fact and take you by surprise that, oh my God, now this fact has been revealed, so the judgment comes in my favor. Whatever fact I have to say, whatever thing I have to say, I'll say it, the other party should have an opportunity to respond to it. And in this way, by doing all this, we are also preventing the miscarriage of justice. Because justice would only be done if I'm giving both the parties, I'm giving them equal opportunity. Both should have a chance to present their case, put their attacks, put their defenses, etc. Now, one important point is that whenever we are dealing with pleadings, it, the pleadings should always be construed liberally and not as strictly as legislations, etc. Because when we unnecessarily strictly interpret pleadings, it will only obstruct uh, the justice delivery system and not facilitate it. Because pleadings in general are not drafted by people uh, who, who actually draft legislations. Pleadings can also be drafted by the party or the plaintiff or the uh, defendant himself. Different persons are drafting those pleadings. So just trying to fix, uh, go forward that uh, requiring that it should be strictly compliant. This paragraph should contain this, this paragraph should contain this or that. That won't help you. Now why pleadings become important? Pleadings become important because they form the foundation of the case. Whenever you have put something in the pleading, you are not allowed to put anything that goes uh, contrary to what you have put in your pleading. You cannot set up a case that is inconsistent with your pleading. So pleadings become the foundation of the case. Pleadings also help the other party to know that what is your case about? What are you trying to say? And they also serve as a report of what is happening. So in general, we understood what are pleadings, simply statements in writing, both the parties, each of the parties will do, they'll write their own story in it, they'll give details so that the other party also knows. I hope this is clear. Now we will move forward to the part of what actually is contained in, a, in the code in respect of pleadings. Now the first rule, that is order six rule one states that pleading is either a plaint or a written statement. Now what is a plaint? A plaint is a pleading, pleading of the plaintiff where he is setting out his claim with his cause of action, all the details that are required and the written statement or the WS is a defendant's plaintiff pleading where he is taking up his defense, he is taking up new claims, he might take up the defense of a counterclaim or a set -off. So rule one is telling in simple one line, a pleading is a plaint or a written statement. Now we move on to rule two. Now rule two is telling us what should a pleading contain. First thing is that a pleading should always contain fact, but not evidence. Fact here what? The facts on which the person's case is depending, which he needs to prove so that he will get some relief. By what? 
what and those facts by which he will try to prove that yes i am entitled to such relief that becomes evidence so you don't need to plead that there and whenever you are trying to talk about a particular allegation or in simple whenever you are talking about or writing a essay or writing anything whenever you need to talk about a new point you change a new paragraph you are also you will divide each allegation into paragraph and number them and wherever there are dates numbers you write them both in words and figures in order to ensure that no one tampers with it right so and also whatever statements you are giving they are should always be in a concise form you should always plead fact and not law really uh, you don't need to first you need to contain the uh, fact uh, and uh, the fact also should be material fact i'm sorry if, uh, it should be fact and the fact also should only be material fact and there should be no evidence now what is the difference between a material fact and a particular a material facts are the primary and the basic facts and the particulars are the details that you provide so in general rule 2 you can uh, uh, shorten it down to plead material fact uh, and not evidence it should be concise divide them into paragraphs and number each of them and date and numbers should always be both in words and figures uh, and then go moving on to yeah so again so it should be in a concise form uh, you should only plead fact and not law fact also that is only material and no evidence now moving on to rule 3 rules three states that that the forms of the pleading should be accordance to the forms that are contained in appendix a of the court not a very important rule now rule 4 now there are certain situations as you read in um, a rule 2 that you don't need to provide particulars when you are drafting up a uh, pleading however rule 4 states that there are certain situations where you are alleging misrepresentation fraud breach of trust willful default etc where you feel they are essential you need to give the particulars with the items and the dates why because just saying that this particular person defrauded me won't help or this particular person tried to misrepresent won't help you need to show how he did misrepresent it you need to show how he de defrauded you or how there was a breach of trust on what date he committed what that led to such an allegation so in this particular scenario you also need to provide material particulars now rule 6 talks about condition precedent now what a condition precedent now for example if there's a particular contract or a particular a particular condition which whose performance is essential uh, and it is that particular conditions performance that is being conduct, uh, contested in a particular pleading then you have to expressly state that that such and such condition was not performed uh, and otherwise if you are not doing so it will be taken for granted that you are impliedly saying that the condition precedent in such a case was satisfied for example if i had to uh, if i had entered into a contract with somebody for buying a car and that person had said that before buying a car you should get me an noc from my employer that you have no or uh, debts etc on your head etc so that becomes a condition precedent before the contract can take place so when uh, and something happens or goes wrong with the contract i want to sue uh, that person wants to sue me if that person does not expressly write in his plaint that he this person did not even comply with the condition precedent of getting an noc from his employer it will be presumed it will be taken it will be implied that the condition precedent was actually performed then rule 7 says that about departure now departure means that as i had already said whatever you put up in a pleading you cannot go beyond it you cannot make new grounds or new claims that is inconsistent with your previous pleadings of your own previous pleadings you can only change by the way of amendment and how we amend we'll see in the later rules now rule 8 is about denial of a contract now denial of a contract is that if you are just saying that no such contract did not happen or you just barely denying a particular contract you will be it will be construed that you are just denying it on the basis of uh, a fact on the basis of fact but not denying its legality if you want to show that it is an illegal contract or any other such aspect you have to specifically state that now moving on to rule 9 rule 9 tells that if there are certain contents of documents that become material and you need to use that in your pleading you have to use it as brief as possible you do not need to put the whole document or reproduce the entire document or the part of the document use 
as use it as briefly as possible unless you feel that yes precise words or materials are required now moving on to rule number 10 which was talking about malice knowledge etc so any condition of mind which you need to show as material you have to just allege the same that yes there was malice on their part you do not need to tell the circumstances from where you are inferring them so here again you are seeing that i am just mentioning the fact and not the evidence because from the evidence i will get the circumstances now rule number 11 is talking about notice if there is a particular notice that is a material in the case just allege it as a fact unless you need to give the precise terms or circumstances related to that notice now rule number 12 is talking about implied contract or relation if you have to infer something from a series of letters conversations circumstances etc you can simply allege the same as a fact you do not need to go into the detail into the conversations letters or circumstances etc and if you need to do that uh, if you need to reply uh, if need to reply in the alternative upon more contracts other than you are saying that other than this set of contract there is another this set of contract or etc you can state it in the alternative so in general you don't need to go into much details when you are referring to letters conversations circumstances or series from where you have to infer certain things unless you this extremely important then rule number 13 is talking about the presumption of law if there is any presumption of law that is lying in your favor or the burden of proof is on the other side you do not need to allege it unless the other side has specifically denied the same now for example if uh, uh, we are suing for a bill of exchange and there the consideration for bill of exchange it is presumed that the consideration has been paid unless other party comes forward and say that no consideration was not actually paid in the case till then you don't need to allege it then for 14th is that pleading anyone by a party pleader or the person who is authorized if you cannot sign the pleading should be signed and 14a is talking about the address for service of notice so apart from a pleading being signed it should also have a statement about the address this particular address will be known as a registered address which holds good for 2 years even after the determination of the matter all service of process will take place there you can always uh, uh, apply to the court and you can update your address if you happens if it happens to be found that the address provided by you is false it is incomplete or fictitious fictitious then the court on its own or the application of the party if if the uh, address was provided by the plaintiff and it is wrong then it can be the suit can be stayed if it is given by the defendant and it is wrong then the defense can be struck out now this stay of suit or defense striking out can be set aside you apply to the court give the correct address first court will feel satisfied okay because of certain issues you could not do so then on ordering on some cost etc they'll uh, they'll set aside the stay of suit or the striking out of defense and then appoint a day for proceeding and court however just because you have given a particular registered address court will may call for that uh, summons may be served at another uh, the process may be served at any other address if it thinks fit that is this required also apart from that rule number 15 stocks about verification of pleadings that is all the pleadings need to be verified at the end by one of the parties at the end or the person who is appointed by it you have to write that so and so numbers i am verifying that they are true to my knowledge and i believe it to be true you have to also sign that thing mention the date and place and then also add an affidavit now these rule 1 to 15 before we are moving to striking out of pleadings let's go back to them again so that it does not become a monologue sort of a thing and it suddenly starts going tangent over your head so first rule we are going back first rule was talking that a pleading is either a state plaint or a written statement rule number 2 is talking that you have let's summarize it and see that it should always be in a concise form you should put the fact and not the law there the fact should also be material there should be no evidence that should be pleaded there allegations should be divided into paragraphs number them dates and numbers should be in figures rule 3 is about the forms in appendix a rule 4 material particulars when become necessary when you are alleging misrepresentation fraud breach of trust etc rule 6 is about talking about condition precedent if you are not expressly con contesting that the condition precedent has not been done then it will be implied that all the conditions precedent necessary for the case have been performed with 
then rule 7 departure is only allowed by the way of amendment other than that you cannot take new grounds or claims which are inconsistent with your pleadings rule 8 that you have to if you are trying to deny the uh, if you are trying to deny a contract on the terms of its legality etc you have to do it expressly because if you do not do so you are just denying the factum of the contract now rule 9 is taking about what is the effect of a document to be stated if you have to talk about a particular document or its contents you have to be as brief as possible unless and until it is very necessary that the exact terms etc are used rule 10 is talking about if you have to allege a particular condition of mind that malice knowledge etc just allege the same as a fact no need to put down the circumstances from where you are inferring that there was fraud, uh, there was malice or or there was a knowledge on this person's part that such and such thing was conducted because here the circumstances form the evidence. Now rule number 11 is about the notice. Here if notice is material, simply allege the same as a fact unless the precise circumstances is needed. An implied contract or relation, you have to infer from a series of letters, conversations, circumstances. Just allege it as a fact, refer to the letters without going into detail. Rule number 13 is about the presumption of law that if anything is in your favor, if any presumption of law is being made in your favor or the burden of proof of the same is on the other side, you do not need to allege it unless it has been specifically denied by the other side. Rule number 14 is talking that the pleading should always be signed. Rule number 14 is telling you that you should also provide an address where the summons will take place that is known as a registered address if you are doing or if you are providing an incomplete false or a fictitious address if it was done by the plaintiff then the suit can be stayed if it was done by the defendant then the defense can be struck out and uh, the stay or the defense whatever the stay of suit or defense striking out can be set aside you apply to the court first give the correct address and then satisfy the court why could you could not do so in the first instance and then that particular order can be set aside and the court if it wants can summon it process service process at any other address also if it deems fit so this was uh, and then rule number 15 which is talking about verification of pleadings where you are seeing that after every pleading you have done you have to verify it at the foot by the party or any of the parties you also have to specify the paragraphs that you are verifying you have to sign it mention the date and place and also furnish an affidavit so this was till verification 1 to 15 we understood what is going on with a, a, a pleading now rule number 16 is talking about striking out pleadings. Now here the court has a discretionary power that at any stage, the court may order that you remove out a certain pleading on the uh, certain matter or amend the matter if it feels that it is unnecessary, it is scandalous, it is frivolous, vexa vexatious, or it's prejudicing, embarrassing, or delaying fair trial of the suit, or otherwise is a process of abuse of process of court. So rule under rule 16, the court has the power to strike out pleadings. Now, next topic, important topics under this is amendment of pleadings. Now, we already know that pleadings from the foundation of your case, you cannot go beyond it. But sometimes circumstances become such that you need to amend it and you have to change that. So for that situation, also, the court has provided you a, a rule that is rule 17. That is amendment of pleadings. Now, here also court may allow either of the parties to amend it amend the pleadings when when it feels it is necessary to determine the real question in controversy between the parties or whenever it deems fit however no amendment shall be allowed if the trial is started before the trial is started it is okay your amendment it is easier to accept an amendment petition but after the trial is started you have to first show that even after due diligence you could not have raised this matter earlier so whenever an amendment is this done you have the court will first check that whether that amendment is actually necessary to, for determining the real question or not, or will it be causing any prejudice or injustice to the other side. So what, when, when are the, there are five circumstances in which we can say that uh, an amendment plea can be refused. First, that it is, the amendment is not necessary to determine the real nature, real question that is involved. Second, it is trying to bring a totally different and a new and an inconsistent case, and it is changing the entire character or the suit or defense. Third, it is causing injustice or prejudice to the other side or you're taking away the legal rights. Fourth, you're trying to do it with malified intentions. You're just trying to put in an amendment plea to delay the process. And fifth, you're trying to introduce time-barred claims by way of amendment. 
now rule number 18 is telling you that what would happen when there is a failure to amend after you have been given an order that yes you are allowed now the court will give you a time limit that you should go and amend your pleading in such and such date but if there is no time limit then it is generally 14 days after that you won't be permitted to amend it unless the court has extended it now refusing to grant permission for amendment is not a decree and you can it is not even an appealable order you can go for a revision against it but revision is a part of the high courts there generally because they know that it is a discretion of the trial courts high courts generally don't interfere and what is the effect of an amendment that has taken place it will date back to the date of the original suit and the question of limitation is also decided on the date of the original filing and not the date of amendment this is why when somebody is trying to put in time barred claims by the way of amendment that is the time when that amendment can be refused now coming to a next topic that is alternative and inconsistent pleadings so alternative pleadings are there where you are trying to put two or more sets of facts which are included and you are claiming relief in the alternative in inconsistent also you are pleading two or more reliefs but they are mutually contradictory and they are uh, contradictory irreconcilable or destructible now in alternative pleadings what happens this is that if you accept one of the pleadings or one of the reliefs it will not lead that it, the other relief is so contrary that it cannot be accepted an inconsistent pleading is that if you accept that one relief the other relief gets automatically destroyed uh, alternative pleadings is not barred by the court because and it is actually encouraged because that will obviate the need of another litigation while inconsistent pleading is not prohibited by the court but it will be subject to order 6 rule 16 where first the court will see whether it is required or not etc so how we can see an example for alternative pleading is you can claim for eviction of a tenant for, on the grounds of either he is not paying rent or in the alternative that you actually require the premises for your own uh, personal purposes and here uh for inconsistent pleadings where you are challenging a particular proceeding on the basis of the rule and you are challenging the very validity of the rule so, uh, now in the nutshell in a nutshell therefore in a nutshell we can understand pleadings as pleadings i have here like uh, before moving i this is a small paragraph that i have tried to make incorporating small small points of all that we have read till now so pleadings can be said as plaint of ws it it's trying telling you to state uh, facts not evidence in state you know state facts not evidence um state only material facts which should be in concise form particulars only when it is necessary condition precedent is always implied unless otherwise stated you cannot depart from your own pleadings if you are denying a contract you have to deny it expressly uh you have to state a document's effect merely state the state of a mind etc notice as a fact is enough you have to refer generally to the implied contractual relation you don't need to state the presumption of law you have to sign pleadings you have to provide the address of service of notice you have to verify pleadings and uh, pleadings can be struck out amended and what would be the effect of failure to amend so in the small place all the important facts so before the exam if you only look up uh, at this paragraph you can these are small pointers that will take you back to the actual rule you can do one thing you can um, beside all the points you can write the rule numbers it's also and that will make it enough for you to remember the points now this was all for pleadings we can now move forward to plaint now what do we understand by plaint now plaint as we understood in order 6 rule 1 was the plaintiff's pleading now plaint also has no express definition in the code but it is a plaintiff's pleading where it is a statement of claim or document by presentation it is also by which a suit is being instituted now what should be there in a plaint is has been given under rule 1 now rule 1 says that first just try and visualize this that what would you write in a plaint first it's in general sense you will try to tell which court you are going to first you'll tell that you'll tell your own name description address not only about yourself against whom you're doing you'll also put that now if in case the defendant that you're going against is a minor or unsound you'll also write that this particular person is minor and unsound now you have to also tell what is the cause of action where it is arising for 
Now, cause of action is also not defined anywhere, but it means the bundle of facts that are required to be proved for getting success. It is not at all dependent on what the defense is taken by the other party or what is the nature of the relief it is being paid. It is the basis on which relief will be asked from the court. Now, what else will be there? Now, what else is for, you also need to show the jurisdiction of the court. You also need to show what you also need to write down what relief you are wanting. If you are actually relinquishing certain amount or you are setting off certain amount, then you also need to mention that. Then you have to tell the value of the subject matter also for the pecuniary jurisdiction and also for the court fees. So rule one is telling you about the particulars that have to be contained in a plaint. Think of it logically, just think. You have to obviously tell which court you are going to. You have to tell your name, description, address, both of the parties, if they are dependent or minor, you'll tell that. What is your cause of action, you'll tell that. Now, how did the court's jurisdiction arise? You will tell the court that. What are you trying to ask? Is there anything that you're relinquishing? You'll tell that what would be the court fees or what is the valuation of your subject matter so that the jurisdiction and the court fees may be decided. Now the next rule, this was very general for plaintiffs. You have to also keep in mind whatever order six says that what, how you have to draft a pleading. Now, next rule is rule two, where it is talking about money suits. So for example, if the suit that you're bringing is a money suit, you have to actually put the exact value of the money whose recovery you are seeking. Now, if it is a mean profit case or an unsettled account case or a movable in possession of defendants, et cetera, where you do not know exactly what is the actual amount, there you can give an approx valuation. But in general, if, the, if some money is involved in the case, it's a money suit, then you need to specify the exact value of money. Now, rule three is talking about the immovable property. Now, if the subject matter is immovable property, naturally you need to give a description of the property. You'll give its identification number, bounty number, khata number, case number, all that you can have seen, land record, revenue record numbers, etc. So that is for immovable property. Now, rule four is when you're suing as a representative. When you're suing in a representative character, first you have to show that you actually have an interest in the subject matter and you also have to show that you have taken all the steps that are required to file a, such a suit, that you've given notice to everybody, that you have taken consent from everybody, etc. and all of that. Now, rule five says that you also need to show the defendant's interest and the liability in respect of the demand. And then rule six states that in case there is a, a situation where you have, you have crossed the limitation period and you want exemption from the limitation, then you need to show why are you, uh, how you are asking for exemption. Now the court can allow on other grounds other than what is given in the plaint, provided that it is not inconsistent with the grounds given in the plaint. Now rule seven says that whatever you want to ask, ask it specifically. You can ask that either give me this or this. And it is not always necessary that certainly that uh, you know that it may be given by the court. You don't need to ask for general relief. Just don't try to give anything that you want. You need to write what you are asking for. And defendant also, if he's trying to claim for certain relief, he has to follow this particular thing. Now, rule eight is saying that if a relief is founded on separate grounds, you have to state them separately and as distinctly as possible. Now, relief has to be seen from the substance of the matter, what actually is arising. Just because it is not worded in the form that I am praying for such and such relief doesn't mean that it precludes the court from actually granting you that relief. And if, for example, I have come to the court and I ask for 15 reliefs, though I might only be entitled to two of them, this does not mean that I have asked for 15 reliefs so the court should dismiss my case it will just grant the relief that am I, I am entitled to and not give the other ones and you already know that even if the court does not give a specific order in respect of the other release rest judicata will apply and it will be deemed that here all those reliefs have been refused now one thing that you can do, rule one to it, whenever you're trying to contain what should a plaint contain, a pleading uh, a pleading of plaint should contain what, you can write all the points under rule one to eight. You'll write all the particulars that need to be there. If it is a money suit, what should be there? If it is a removal property is involved, what should be there? Relief, how should it be stated? Uh, then uh, you, if they are asking for exemption for limitation, you should state that. Interest and liability of the defendant should be stated. If you're suing as a representative, what you should have a right? So this can be written down there. 
Now, what does Rule Nine state? Rule Nine states that what happens after the plaint is admitted. Now, the moment your plaint is accepted and admitted by court, it will issue summons to the defendants. That is under Order Five, Rule Nine. That we'll study later. Now, here and how you what and what what is required? The court will require you to provide the number as number of copy as many number of copies of the plaint as many number of defendants are there within a period of seven days, and also the fees. that is required for the service of summons so in rule 9 you to remember you have a 7 day period uh, to provide the number of copies as as the same as the number of defendants and also the fees for sending the summons now this was that part now 10 is an important which is return of plaint there are two things that will happen here is return when a plaint can be returned by the court or when the plaint can be rejected by the court you have to remember that distinction now what happens when there is a return a return taking place return happens when the court finds that you have come to the wrong court so it will tell you that go to a proper court where it should be instituted now appellate and revisional court can also do so they can set aside a decree and tell you that okay no you need to go back to a proper court now when you are the court is returning the plaint it may endorse the date on which it was presented to it and it may endorse a date on which the court is ordering the return it will put the name of the party and why is it ordering the return it will also write the same this is return of plaint return of plaint is what when the court feels that it has you have come to the wrong court that you should have gone to another court that is why it is redirecting you to go take the plaint to that court and when they are returning they'll write the date when you brought it to this court which day the court returned it who was a party who had brought it and why the court just returned it now rule 10e tells you that the power the court also has a power to fix the date of appearance in the court where the plaint has to be filed after its return now here what happens now if in a suit defendant has also appeared now court feels that the, the that the the plaint has to be returned now what it will do it will tell the plaintiff its decision now when the court is giving the such a decision to the plaintiff it is telling that we i we feel that this court uh, this particular plaint should be presented elsewhere that is why we want to return it plaintiff may do what it may file an application he'll specify that this is the court where i really want to now prepare present it so i pray before you that you fix a date there and give me notice and also to the defendant about the fixing of the date that is there so to the first court only the plaintiff is praying that okay i want now want to go to that court so please fix a date there and give both of us notice now if the application such an application is made court before he, they return the plaint even if it, the returning is done on the grounds that there is no jurisdiction they'll fix a date and give notice as has been stated above now if a notice has been given of appearance has been given to both the parties it will not necessitate a summons to be given to the defendant in the other court now unless the court feels that yes there is certain reason that you need to give summons again and another thing important is that if i have been informed by the court that the court wants to decide that this plaint needs to be returned and i have also filed an application for fixing of date then i waive off my right of appeal against such order of return now then there is rule 10b if we are appealing against the order of transfer of suit and then the appellate court still feels that no it was valid order they may direct that you go to or uh, present it to the it may also take the again the same thing they can also fix a date etc however all this that is being taken place just because an appellate court has told that no you have to go to this particular court only now the plaint needs to be returned this doesn't mean that i cannot question the jurisdiction of the court where now i am presenting the suit now rule 11 that is a mother important rule that which talks about rejection of a plaint we understood what is the return of plaint now we are understanding rejection of a plaint rejection of a plaint is also important in terms of the definition of a decree because under decree rejection of a plaint is also a deemed decree so when can we reject a plaint when you see that there is no cause of action being disclosed the claim that is there has been undervalued and even after time was given by the court to correct it has not been done proper valuation has been done but stamping is insufficient and time was given still you have not done it and whatever you are asking for is barred by law when you have not filed your plaint in duplicate 
as you had seen before, order four, and you have failed to comply with rule nine. That is, as soon as your plaint was admitted, you were uh, given seven days time where you had to file then as number of as many number of copies as there are number of defendants, and then you have to also also give the fees for the process, the service, etc. You have not given. These are the six grounds where a plaint can be reject, uh, rejected. Now, uh, for example, where there is undervaluation of claim or when you're trying to correct the valuation or insufficient stamping, that will not be extended the time that has been provided unless plaintiff will try and come and show that it was valid reasons and why if this time extension is not allowed, grave injustice will follow. And whenever this time is allowed, the reasons have to be recorded in writing. So, and rule 12 also says that whenever you reject a plaint, you have to record an order with reasons. And rule 13 is an important rule which states that just because a plaint has been rejected, it does not preclude fresh filing of suit on the same cause of action. If your suit has been, if your plaint has been rejected, you can come again with a fresh suit on the same cause of action. Now rule 14 to 17, now we'll see about the documents. Now, if I'm relying on a particular document, normal sense, I need to produce a list on the number of documents that I'm providing, all the documents and its copies. If it is not in my possession, then I have to state in whose possession the document is lying. And I, if I am not producing or putting the name of the document in the list that I'm providing to the court, or I'm not producing the copy there, then the court, unless without court gives permission, I cannot adduce it in evidence. And nothing of this section will uh, the rule will apply to a document which is produced for cross examining a plaintiff witness or only for the purpose of refreshing the memory. And rule 16 is about lost negotiable instruments. If I am uh, the first thing is that if it is a lost negotiable instrument, I have to prove that it, uh, it is actually lost. And if it is proved, then the court will pass an order as if the document was produced in court or is or if the court was apprised which person has it is and rule 17 is talking about the banker's book, where the entry is made in a shop book, etc. All those which are subject to banker's books, Evidence Act 1891, here uh, they may call for it, produce it at the time of filing. What the court can do, court itself or by an officer appointed, they'll mark the document, they'll examine it, then compare the copy that has been given to them and they'll see that if it is found correct, you certify it and then return it back to the plaintiff because there are books of importance. Without it, the business cannot be done. It is, it is, it is not just related to the transaction in question. That particular book contains so many more details. That is why the court will try and compare and see whether it is correct or not and then return back the original to the person. So in a nutshell, what did we learn in order seven? was that a plaint, where in a plaint you'll first write the name of the court, name and description, address of both the parties, minor unsound, write a statement about it, cause of action you will uh, write, where it arose, where it did not arise, what is the court's jurisdiction, what is the relief you are asking, did you set off or relinquish any claim, what is the valuation of subject matter, what is the court fee, if it is a money suit, then what is the value of money, Immovable property, then its description. What is the defendant's interest and liability? The exemptions from limitation. Relief, you have to plead it specifically, separate grounds, then state it separately. And if it is admitted, then obviously issue summons subject to the seven days, etc. A plaint can be returned or rejected. And if it is rejected, there are six grounds. Rejected plaint, fresh suit can be filed. If it is returned, then you'll pick, there will be fixation of date and notice. And documents, you know that you need to produce it. Lost negotiable instruments, first you have to prove that it is lost. And then about the bankers book. So these two paragraphs, as you had seen in pleadings also, I had put a certain part. I have tried to put down small, small pointers of all the points that are included in the rules so that if before going to the exam, if you even look at it, it, it just works as a hint that reminds you of the entire provision. This is how you should go forward. Now this is plaint that has been done. Now we can move forward to written statement, but we will not do set off and counterclaim because otherwise it will become too long a lecture. So as you understand, written statement is also not defined. It is a pleading of the defendant here. What they'll be writing, whatever has been written in the uh, plaint, now we'll reply to it, we'll deny it, we'll whatever they have to deny it or accept it. Here they can also write new facts or, and take objections. Now the first rule is stating when what is the time limit for giving a written statement. 
written statement has been given with from 30 days from the date of summons that has come to you and this time can be extended for another 60 days so a total of 90 days only maximum of 90 days within 90 days you have to file your written statement 30 days first if you fail to do so court may extend for another 60 days now rule one is that if he is trying to uh, if he is trying to claim a certain uh, relief or he is relying on certain document he also has to produce the document same way as we had seen and plaint then if they are trying to rule number two is saying that if you are trying to put in new facts on anything etc then you have to specifically plead the same if you are trying to show that this particular uh, suit is not maintainable this transaction is void avoidable this particular ground is not raised etc then you have to put it specifically then rule three is that you have to give a specific denial you just can't say i deny all the allegations in the plaint no you have to deal with them separately and if you are not doing so if you're not doing so then you it is assumed that you're admitting the same and you have to steal that then separately saying that you're not admitting so and so fire for so and so reason except for the particular paragraph that would be dealing with the damages that is being asked now what is evasive denial that is dealt with court now when you're trying to deny an allegation you have to deal with it specifically and answer to the point you just cannot just say that okay i deny this particular allegation now it's like somebody has said that you have received 100 rupees fraudulently, fraudulently. now you just can't say that no i did not receive 100 rupees fraudulently now you have to say that no on this particular date i did not receive a sum or i did receive such and such sum but it was a part of such and such transaction so this just shows that it is not a fraudulent transaction etc then rule number five is that specifically you have to deny that is if an allegation you are not denying it specifically or by necessary implication or you're not stating is not admitted then it is all or as i already said it is taken as admitted unless it is against a person of disability and uh, for example if you have not filed a ws then the court can pass a judgment based only on the plaint but not but the, it will not do so if it is against a person laboring under a disability like unsoundness minor etc now and judgment will be drawn up here it will be also in accordance decree will be also drawn up and the decree will be having the date of the judgment now rule number seven is saying that if you are setting up any defense if you are taking up any set off if you're taking out a counterclaim etc you have to state it distinctly and separately now if there's a new ground of defense which came after institution of suit or again same thing you have to put it separately and distinctly any subsequent pleadings that you want to give other than set off or counterclaim after you have given your written statement you cannot do so except with the lead of leave of court and if you will uh, if you are doing so the court will fix time which is not more than 30 days for the same and rule number 10 is saying that if you are not presenting your written statement within time that is under rule one within the 30 plus 60 days or under rule 9 very subsequent readings also you are not doing so on time then the court can pronounce judgment against him and they will make such an order in relation to the suit as it deems fit and decree will also follow so this was for written statement we have not completed written statement that is why there is no inner nutshell here so written statements first thing it is a pleading of the defendant you have to remember rule one for the time limit 30 plus 60 days that is total more not more than 90 days from the date of summons rule 1a is talking about the documents that you need to produce uh, if you are relying on something you need to produce it and put it in writing if you are trying to put in new facts then you have to specifically split the same if you are trying to deny something you should be specific you should not be evasive and you should be specifically denying it otherwise it will be taken as admitted and if you're not filing a ws court can file uh, can give its judgment only on the basis of the plaint and rule number seven states that if there is any defense set off or counterclaim that you are founding on separate grounds again you have to state it distinctly and separately for so even for new grounds of defense that you're taking stated separately and distinctly subsequent pleadings also you have to do if you're wanting to do so court is allowing you within 30 days and if you don't do so the court will make an order as it deems fit without even taking your practice into consideration because you've been given enough time to file in your thing so very generally you have to understand for written statement is the date everything relying on document then do it so 
separately do not be it should be a specific denial it should not be an evasive denial if you are not denying specifically it will be taken as admitted if you are setting up a new defense or a set of counterclaim it should be on separate grounds subsequent pleadings what you have to do so this is a broad way i broad way in which we are dealing with written statement there's still left to written statement but this is where we'll stop today i hope pleadings under order 6 is clear replaint under order 7 is clear and a written statement is also clear to an extent you have seen i've tried to provide uh, in a nutshell what what are the main points of a plaint what are the main points of a pleading i hope you have understood it the class has not become too long and boring and this is for today i hope you like the lecture if there's any any problem with the lecture please let me know if there is there is any need for any clarifications so thank you we'll be meeting tomorrow with a new lecture fresh new lecture and um, that's it for today thank you